I'm amazed that you guys are still here. <laughs> None of you have ran away. Uh, and, and I really appreciate it. Man, I've, I've seen visitors popping in week after week and, and people that I haven't seen in quite some time popping back up. And it just, I don't know, it, makes, it gets me excited. You know, we, we're going to be looking at this great section of what Paul has to say to the churches in Galatia. And again, I say that I'm excited because there are so many questions and the word reveals so much good stuff. I mean, it's encouraging, but it's also convicting. But at the end of the day, it's powerful stuff. If I have any advice for anyone here in our church or, or those that are listening online, look, just start reading the word. Just get into this book. I'm telling you, it, it, it's just a thing. It's chock full of great stuff. And if you don't understand something, that's okay. Keep reading. Keep researching. Keep learning. Ask questions to your church family. Ask questions to your pastor, your former pastor. I know Fran, will, she'll take a question in any beat. Okay? Ask somebody. Just get into this stuff. And I'm telling you, God's Word really just... It will amaze you sometimes. But let's go ahead and look at this section. If y'all will stand with me as we read God's Word. Galatians 1, 18 through 24. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. You may be seated. Melanie and I were discussing the scriptures coming up the other night, uh, and we both agreed that I should probably try to read this passage from the Word and then paraphrase it uh, as if I was talking to someone who's a part of Gen Z. Does anyone know what Gen Z is? So Gen Z, Generation Z, is this, this generation behind me. You know, we've got XYZ, one, two, three, millennials. Uh, they got all these different names for them. But just a little paraphrase. So... Uh, if you're not a part of Gen Z, if you're a baby boomer, or what's after baby boomer? Gen X? Gen X, I believe it is. You can, you know, if you don't recognize some of the terminology I'm about to use, it'll be okay. Okay, but Mitchell, Mitchell, uh, Mitchell, he's a millennial, correct? Okay, so Mitchell will understand about, uh, yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to think, so you, let's see. It would be around Gen Z, millennial section. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is Paul, and he's saying this. So, after like three years, I went to Jerusalem to visit my dude here. Or as my buddies call him, Cephas. I stayed with my bro for 15 days. I didn't even go to the other peeps of Jesus, except James, who was Jesus' brother. And if anyone knows J.C., it should be his brother James. James is Jesus Christ. Look, my bros, I'm not lying to you. I went later on to Syria and Cilicia, and dude, they still didn't even know who I was in the big church circles. But they had heard about me, and they knew I was being a big jerk. That I had been killing Christians like I was actually killing people. I was messed up. But I turned around and I decided to become a follower of Jesus. I started hollering down the streets about him. I know I was like the scum of the earth, but thankfully these guys began telling God, thank you. Thank you, God, for saving someone truly as bad as Paul. If that dude can be saved, then nothing is impossible. So... Y'all were picking it up, right? Yeah, not too bad. Maybe more people would understand. Yeah. A little recap from last week, though. Again, Paul's talking to the churches in Galatia. 
this group that has been dealing with this issue of whether it was the faith in Jesus or if it was the traditional Jewish works that would make you right in God's eyes. At the end of last week's passage, we saw where Paul uh, says that after he had been converted, after he saw the miraculous vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus, that he didn't immediately go to Jerusalem to seek out the apostles. Instead, the scripture says this, and after three years, I went to Jerusalem. So for three years, we talked about Paul was in this region known as Arabia. Now, unlike modern-day Arabia, which we would think would include that whole section of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Saudi Arabia. However, I took this from the Ancient Arabia Languages and Culture Project at the University of Oxford. And they say this, in modern English, Arabia would refer to the Arabian Peninsula where Saudi Arabia is located. However, in the first century, the designation could also refer to the Syrio-Arabian Desert farther north, which includes portions of modern-day Syria and Jordan. This would have led Paul right into the tribes, the villages, and the cities surrounding Damascus. And he probably would have come back and forth to Damascus during this time. Whenever he says he went out into the desert of Arabia, He's kind of going back and forth to Damascus. He kind of makes that his base camp. Now, this is backed up by the book of Acts, chapter 9. Now, I'm going to read quite a lot of this just because it's a great, it's a great text. And this is right after, again, after Paul has seen Jesus. Okay, and it's going to tell us. So Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise, and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Verse 14, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name, this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. <coughs> Lord, and I, going through and reading this, I said, Lord, please make me more like Ananias. God gave him a simple direction. He said, go. You'll notice he even questioned God, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. And God tells him, Ananias, I've got this. I've got this. 
I know what you've heard about this guy from Tarsus. Child of mine, go. Do what I've asked. And here's the beautiful part is Ananias goes. And the first thing that he says to Paul, Brother Saul. Notice that. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He greets him as a friend, as a brother. Even though Paul had been an enemy. From his miraculous healing, Paul was baptized and immediately went to the synagogues. He went into the big churches to proclaim that Jesus was the Son of God. Later on, though, we see that Paul has to escape Damascus by being lowered from a window in a basket to avoid being hunted down and killed himself. He had upset the status quo. The very people that he once saw as peers, the Jewish elite, he was on their team. But this Jewish elite, they were able to get the government of Damascus to go after Paul, but he escaped. He went out, and he kept spreading the gospel, and he kept proclaiming that Jesus was the Son of God. Ooh, tell me. That, that's one that will hit you right in the chest, and you go, boom. Hallelujah. Paul was changed. Look, let's switch gears real quick. Let's talk about being unknown. Now, before his conversion, Paul was very well known among not only the Jews, but also the Christians. Unfortunately, as we saw from today's verses and the weeks prior, uh, he was known for the persecution of the church. Now, as today's scripture said, they didn't know him in person. They had only heard of him. They heard of what he had done to the church, and they had heard about the change that had happened in his life. And you know, we, we live in a small town, and I, I came from an even smaller town. And I'm, I'm telling you, Alexandria was like the city. No joke. It was... When we went to town, and where I grew up is about 45 minutes away from here. And there's no easy way to get there. But I remember, oh, we're going to Walmart. That's a big deal. But even Alexandria is a small city. And you know what? News gets around Alexandria quickly. You know, that grapevine gets shorter and shorter. And ever since, oh, Lord, these things right here, shoo. That grapevine doesn't even exist anymore. The grapes are sitting right beside each other. You know, I, I want you to, to think about this and let this mull around in your mind for a little bit. What have people heard about you? Just think about it. I want you to just kind of think about that. Because as the apostles had heard now, they didn't know him in person, but they had heard of Paul. What have people heard about you? You think about that as we cover the verses. And look, let's look at verse 18. Again, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. Paul went into Jerusalem to visit with Peter or Cephas for 15 days. We get these two names back and forth in the early text. As Peter was first called, and you can go ahead, he was, his original name was Simon, right? And then Jesus tells him, you know, okay, no longer am I going to call you Simon. You're going to be known. And actually the, Ara the Aramaic is Kepha, okay? And then the Hebrew, Cephas. And you see all these translations, Greek, Petros, Latin, Petra, the English gets into Peter. These all mean rock, right? So Cephas is just the Hebrew word for rock. So when we're talking about Cephas in these scriptures, Cephas, Peter, same guy. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now Paul didn't see any of the other apostles except for James, and yes, James, the Lord's brother. Go back to that verse for me. 
James, the Lord's brother. For many, uh, they assumed that Mary did not have any other children, that these, uh, all these siblings of Jesus, they were just some of Joseph's children. No, no, no. This was the Lord's brother. Mary was a virgin when she gave birth to Christ. However, there's nothing telling us that she stayed a virgin. She had other children, right? <laughs> Verse 20. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. And look, this is just another confirmation of what he's, what he's writing. He says, you know, I was, I was not taught all this theology by someone else. Everything that I'm writing is true. If you don't believe me, I'm telling you that before God, I'm not lying. Okay, and look, Amy, I know you'll know this one. Because when we, so working in a high school setting, how many times, Amy, have you heard a kid say, I, I, I'm not lying, I swear, I swear to God I'm not lying. <laughs> all the time, all the time. Okay, now I notice you didn't go to second hour. I, I was in the second hour. Mm, your teacher marked your accent, said you weren't there. Uh-uh, no, I was there. Mr. James, I'm not lying. I swear I'm not lying. Okay? They're using that as an affirmation. The thing is here is that Paul is saying, before God, I am not lying to you. Verse 21, he says, Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea there in Christ. He says next, after I left Jerusalem, I went back north to Syria and Cilicia. He stayed around the Mediterranean Sea. And he was teaching everyone around those areas about Jesus being the Son of God. Now look, this small little section, this little cult, as they were called, of early Christians, of, of early Jews that began believing in Christ, they really started branching out. And Paul was the one who was, he was excited. He was going the extra mile. He was going out of the comfort zone to try to tell people. He was going into territories where people had heard nothing other than folk religion and the Roman pantheon of gods. Paul was bringing them something greater, much greater. In verse 23, they were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. The church leaders in Jerusalem were hearing it said that the very person that was killing them, that was hunting them down, was now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. And it wasn't just, and, and we've got to get into a different mindset here. He wasn't just trying to destroy the faith. I, I want you to imagine for a second, if all of us in this room, if we very literally had to hide, we had to pretend that we weren't Christian, or we had to go into each other's homes, in order to have church. We couldn't have a, a nice building like this with nice air conditioning. No, we had to hide out in a cellar somewhere. And when we sang our hymns, we had to sing them quietly. We had to make up different names for one another. Greg, you'd have to come up with a nickname for me. It'd be like the president. You know, you can say like the eagle has landed. I'd be more like the buzzard, but uh, <laughs> imagine though, these people were literally running for their life just to be able to worship God. In verse 24, and they glorified God because of me. He says, and they glorified God because of me. They sang hymns, they praised God, and they were excited that someone that they knew or had heard of as this boogeyman, as this bounty hunter, as the enemy, had become a friend, had become a brother. They were thrilled. Now, 
later on do we find out, did they have their doubts about whether he was for real? Sure they did. Now look, I asked you a question earlier. I said, what have people heard about you? Again, we live in a small city, and I checked. In the last census, we had over 150,000 people in the Alexandria metropolitan area. I didn't even know that was such a thing. But actually, the metropolitan area, it includes almost all of Grant Parish and Rapids Parish. So there's 150,000 people, give or take. Now, the city of Alexandria itself consists of about 46,000 people. I was kind of impressed with that. It's like 46,000 people. Where are they at? <laughs> they're around. Yep, they're around. However, in, in your circles, at your job, at your church, any other public function that you attend, do people know you? Your neighbors, do they know you? The people that live down the street from you, do they know you? Have any of these people heard about you? And if they have, what have they heard? When someone mentions your name in a conversation, do they mention that you're different? Dare I say, do they mention that you're a follower of Christ? That you call yourself a Christian? Do they know you as a person of faith? Are you someone that they can come to for advice? Someone that they know they can confide in if they needed help? Do they know you as a self-righteous Pharisee? Or do they know you as someone who likes to spread the gospel? Now look, for those of you who might not know this, and this might surprise you, I am what is called an introvert. Okay? Go ahead. Introversion or an introvert versus extroversion or an extrovert. And all of us in this room are one of these two things or we're a little mix of the two, right? An introvert is someone who uses a great deal of energy to be around people. When I'm home, it is my, my sanctum solace. It is my place of quietness. I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of self-reflection. And you'll be glad to know, church, that I even pray. Okay? During these moments are, are when I'm really thinking about what God has for me, what he's got for you guys, what he's got for our future. For me, going to a large group of people, I've got to be charged up. Which is funny because, you know, I spent quite a lot of time on stage in front of people singing gospel music and, you know, talking with people after concerts. And now, I, I mean, I'm kind of doing the same thing in one way or another. And you can ask my wife. After church, I take naps. I'm a firm believer in it. Anybody out there say amen? Amen. <laughs> Ken, I know you, Ken's a, a fan of after church naps. Look, on the other hand, an, an extrovert is someone that they feel like their energy is drained when they are alone. Okay? They need to be around people. They thrive when they can be the one that's setting the mood in a group of people. They don't mind being in the spotlight because not because they're an attention hall, but because they can just take that type of attention. Again, these type of people, they need to get out and socialize. They need to be around people. I know a certain former pastor of this church who I would say is very much the definition of an extrovert. <laughs> Here's the truth about extroverts and introverts. Neither version is good or bad, okay? It, they're just different in the way they interact with people. Extroverts like to be, a, a, to be able to move amongst groups, while the, the introverts prefer the smaller group setting. Here's the similarities. is We don't want to be known for the wrong thing. Oftentimes, we'd rather be unknown than to be known at all. 
Okay, extroverts want to be seen positively, introverts do as well. Sharing the gospel, though, is often seen as something that isn't quite positive. You and I have seen way too many people that they come to your door and they got their little pamphlet. Hello, would you like to talk about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? <laughs> May we come in? <laughs> And you and I both know, and what's really bad is when they give you that like thousand mile stare and it's like going past your head and can we talk to you about you? It, you, you know what I'm talking about. We, but we've got this negative connotation, right? About what it means to spread the gospel. You know, Paul was known by many people. Yet, it says he was unknown in person. They had begun rumors that this great persecutor of the church had now become a believer. How I wish, how I wish that someone would spread a rumor like that about me. Lord, you should hear all the other ones that people <laughs> spread. How I wish people would say, you know that Jordan James that teaches high school, you know, he does the real estate stuff, and you know, he goes to church over there at the Tree Church, Live Oak Community Church. You know, that guy believes in Jesus. That guy always talks about, he says, you know, no, no, I'm not perfect, but you know, Jesus was perfect. He's a nice guy. He's humble. He's kind to people. He's been more forgiving to folks than I would ever be. There's something different about that Jordan James. Man, I wish I could be like him. As much as I wish that was the case, oftentimes it's not. I've fallen short of that. I'm sure you have as well. I'm not someone who's always done what was right, nor will I ever be. Although I try to be. I am just as imperfect and just as much a lowly sinner as anybody else. And all I'm trying to do is serve a perfect and just God. Amen? Somebody say amen, amen. to that. Amen. As Paul has stated, it was because of my circumstance that God, that people should praise God. It's not that I'm perfect. It's that he is. But here's the deal. Is there something different? There should be something different about me. The question is, is when you become a believer, or when you became a believer, should you be different? What's different about you? You know, I can, I can only tell this uh, by the way the scripture tells us. The disciples asked Jesus, he says, you know, okay, what, what, how are people going to know us? What should we do to be good Christians? And Jesus responds to them, you'll be known by your love. We'll be known by the way that we love God and the way we love others. I am going to repeat this a million times before I die. Now, does love always mean giving in to what the world is teaching? No, it does not. Does it mean that we will lay aside everything that we believe is true for someone else that's coming to us with a lie? No, that is not love. Does it mean that we will pretend that when we know someone is doing something that's not good for them, that we'll pretend that it's okay, that it's right. No. Y'all, I've got, I've got two kids. They are at uh, Mim and Paul's house this weekend. They were going to vacation Bible school. And for those of you that have kids, it doesn't even matter if you have kids. If you've been around people with kids, you know exactly where I'm going with this. When my kid goes for a light socket, I yell, no! I explained to them why we don't do something because it could hurt us. And I even tell them why I might seem aggravated or I might seem mad in that moment. We've got a swimming pool in the backyard. And that joker's deep. 
And from time to time, I have to get on with the kids and I say, look, you're not allowed to go near that swimming pool without an adult. And I explain to them, it is deep. If you fall in and there's no one around, you might drown. I want you to be safe. I don't want you to drown. Obviously, I'm your daddy. I love you. I don't want you to be hurt. Just like I'm telling my child that I don't want them to drown, God is telling us this. I have a better life set up for you. Sin will drown you. It causes sorrow. And sorrow will drown you. This stuff that's pleasing you now it's just temporary. It's like you're putting rocks in your shoes. It will drown you if you let it. The lifestyle that you're holding on to so dearly that you know isn't right, it will drown you. And he says, I'm trying to give you a life raft. I am giving you the way out. Grab a hold of me. Paul was unknown in person amongst the churches of Judea. They knew of him and they had heard about what he was preaching. And when they did, they glorified God. They knew that this man was preaching the gospel. That he was telling the truth. Folks, we've got to be different. We've got to be set apart. We've, we've got to be something that other people talk about. We might be unknown in person, but we should be known by the gospel that we follow and the love of Christ that we give to others. Look, both the simple love of just being kind just be compassionate. And the hard love of building other people up. Sometimes it's not so easy. Amen. My friends and the folks that are listening online, anybody that ever hears this message or can hear my voice right now, if you say that you're a Christian, people should know. If someone would be surprised to find out that you believe in Christ? That's not a good sign. It's not a good sign. Matthew 10, 32 through 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men I will also deny, deny before my Father who is in heaven. Don't walk through life calling yourself a Christian. When at the end of the day, you might be unknown to him. Be known. Be known. If you believe in him, let it be known. Live it. Take pride in it. Take pride that you are a follower of the Savior of the world. Everybody you need ought to know. Now stand. God, I love these folks. Lord, I pray for every single one of them. God, I ask that you continue to encourage all of us. God, the, the folks like me that, that get really comfortable with my little circle of people and God, I, you know, I there are days whenever I know I don't want to go talk to that stranger about Jesus. He's going to think I'm crazy. God, push me out of my comfort zone. And God, I ask that you push this whole church out of our comfort zone. Push us outside of these walls. God, what a gift. What a, what a wonderful thing that we that we have ownership and we have victory in, God. We have the sacrifice. We have the redemption of our sins. 
God, let us go out and tell people. Let us live it every single day. And God, when we fall, when we mess up, when we make mistakes, put your hand out, God, so that we can get back up. That we can keep, keep going. God, that we can keep telling people. That we can keep loving people. That we can keep serving you. That we can keep learning about you. Lord, that we can just keep on keeping on. We love you. We ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Love you, my friends. God, have a great week. Bro, Pastor, I'm like digging on this sermon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I told you because it looked like you don't care.